Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Contagion Cultures uh, uh, 2.0. I guess that I myself, when I uh, thought to contact Faculty of Arts and Science, and then they put me in touch with uh, po um, political, I mean, uh, policy studies. I didn't really expect this would be in its second year, but here we are. Here we are. Uh, and actually, for those of you who might be interested in presenting in this series, please feel free to contact me at jhosek at queensview.ca for next semester. We're particularly interested, me being from Faculty of Arts and Sciences, particularly interested in what the humanities has to say about this, but of course we're very interested in everything that our faculty in general, we have so many different skill sets here at Queens, uh, has to say about the pandemic and pandemic cultures and, and uh, all of the many aspects of this, uh, of this situation that we find ourselves in. And what, before we start today uh, on Tuesday, the 19th of October, I'd like to recognize that we're on Dashanabe and Haunashoni lands. And I'm grateful to live and work here. And I feel that we need to work to try to right the wrongs that have been perpetrated and to think about how to take indigenous ways of knowing in order to incorporate it into our ways of living so that we have a better chance of survival because the uh, pandemic is certainly partly simply a symptom of climate intensification and the ways that we live. We have a lot to learn from indigenous people's ways of being with the land and being with each other and being uh, together as community. I'd also like to uh, note that on the 16th of November at 4.30, we have our next talk when Dr. Sashil Singh will speak on operationalizing race in its use to track the impact of COVID-19. That'll be a very interesting talk. And also to remind you that the, these talks are available freely online and they're also archived at the library. And we hope that you'll use them for teaching and also share them widely when you register for the talks. Feel free to share the information and uh, get the word out globally. As we uh, uh, have the our speaker today. Please put questions uh, in the Q and A. You can find it in the lower portion of the screen. And today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Samantha Butamir, and she's speaking on the dispor disproportionate impacts of COVID nineteen. Dr. Samuel. Samantha Butamir holds a, an MD from Queen's University, an MSc in Public Health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and a BSHC from McMaster's. She completed her residency training in both family medicine at Queen's in 2017 and public health and preventive medicine at Queen's in 2021. She's currently acting as public health advisor to Queen's University. Associate Program Director for the PHCM Residency Program, and she teaches master's courses in health systems, health policy and management. And she also maintains her clinical work through a focused practice in sexual health and immunization at Student Wellness Services and a locum family practice at Queen's DFM. So she's a busy, busy professional woman, and she is interested in bridging the gap between primary care and public health with a focus on populations made vulnerable by societal structures. Her academic interests center on medical education and health systems. We're very happy to have her today. And I'll turn the table over to the, the view over to you, Sam. I am on mute, thank you. <laughs> You'd think I'd be used to that by now. Um, I'm just gonna share the screens so that I can get my slides going. Um, and I do wanna keep this fairly, not 
completely informal, but I, I do love to see question and discussions come up in the chat. And, and I think actually we have a fairly small group, which is nice here. So if people want to post questions about a specific topic I'm talking about, and I see it pop up in the chat, I am happy to kind of address that um, as we go and as we're on specific topics. Um, I've been doing some Zoom teaching since winter of last year. So I'm kind of used to keeping tabs on everything, but I'm not perfect. Um, so we will just, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, I also apologize. My daughter, unfortunately, is homesick today. She's managed to thankfully not get COVID, but she does have a bug and she's out of daycare. So my husband managed to get home in time to, to stay with her. But if you hear her crying in the background, don't worry, she's okay. Um, all right, so everyone can see what I'm off have here in terms of the screen. Um, so I just want to thank you for, first of all, taking the moment to join me um, in this talk today, looking at the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19. Um, I did give a version of this talk back in January. Some of you might have caught it. I had a very limited space to, to cover it in our kind of COVID one year later session, but um, there's a lot to unpack here in terms of um, addressing how the pandemic really hasn't been equally felt by all in society. Um, and I'm going to hopefully expand on some of the thoughts that I brought up in January and then bring up some new issues that have arisen since January, particularly around vaccine equity. So in this pandemic, this image is something that I think a lot of us have seen with regards to COVID. Um, and it's this idea of, of all of us being in the same storm. COVID is a storm that we're all experiencing and different parts of the world might be in different parts of the storm at different times. Um, but fundamentally what's different here is that we're not all in the same boat. Um, we are not equally sharing in the burdens of the storm of COVID itself or of um, the vaccine rollout of COVID or the uh, economic and societal impacts of pandemic action. Because fundamentally, public health action um, can have significant ramifications on societal functioning, as we've seen. And um, not everybody feels that equally. So to start, I'm going to talk um, about a variety of different groups um, that have experienced a, a, a lack of equity in this um, pandemic, but I wanna be clear that I'm not covering absolutely everything. Um, and that uh, this is just kind of a snapshot of some different groups and some different issues that I've seen, but by no means is representative of the entire issue. It's gonna take us honestly decades to unpack this. I'm sure there are people who are gonna spend, devote their careers to looking at how the pandemic has played out in terms of um, societal impacts and health systems impacts. Um, Going back to Jennifer's introduction of me, thank you, Jennifer, that was lovely. Um, you can kind of get the idea that I'm interested in policy and I'm obviously interested in public health as a public health physician, but I also have a deep interest in health systems and health system functioning. So I am taking a bit of that lens here when talking about this, um, which I know not everybody is um, health systems focused in this, uh, that is listening to this talk, but hopefully you guys can kind of follow along and, and I should be able to make it pretty straightforward. Um, the cat is also meowing now because everybody decided that today is just gonna be hectic, uh, but, but that's okay. That's part of um, working from home these days. So the first group I'm gonna address is um, individuals in care. Um, and this was one group that felt the ramifications of COVID immediately. Wave one is really, emphasized by the impact on this group. Um, there's a dramatically disproportionate amount of death that has happened in um, nursing homes across Canada. And it's, it's really the bulk of the death um, and, and morbidity associated with COVID that we've seen in this country has been centered on these environments. We have, um, you know, when, when you're getting to case fatality rates for people, you know, um, Young people, the case fatality rates are quite low for COVID, but for older adults um, and who make up the majority of people living in care, along with the fact that younger people living in care often have medical comorbidities that make them more vulnerable to something like COVID, um, you really just have a group that's kind of a sitting duck for, <laughs> hello, Goose. 
Kikun wants to say hi. Um, you have a group that's been a, um, really we're a sitting duck for this sort of problem. And at the time that COVID started, I was working um, uh, at KFLNA Public Health, completing my residency in public health. So I was working with Dr. Moore um, and um, others at the health unit. And um, the summer before, we'd actually had meetings with groups from across the region um, with uh, providers in retirement homes, nursing homes, um, hospital members to talk about what the community approach would be to a pandemic. We were thinking that we were due for a bad flu season. <laughs> um, we didn't really think that it was going to be what COVID has turned out to be, but it's we know that, you know, um, it, respiratory outbreaks happen frequently in long-term care settings and in retirement home settings, and we kind of saw this coming. And so fast forward from the summer to, you know, where we laid a lot of the groundwork to early 2020, um, you know, January and February, when we started getting case reports of COVID, um, it was very clear to those of us working at the health unit that um, this population was highly at risk. And so um, at the time, it was possible to put in some pretty intensive um, efforts to try to improve the safety of these environments. Um, things like having per personal protective equipment, um, making sure that people's outbreak management procedures were robust. So do they track every single person that develops symptoms? Do they cohort people who are symptomatic and not symptomatic? Um, and ensuring that this response was um, robust and cohesive and consistent across the region um, is part of why we didn't see substantial COVID outbreaks in KFLNA in our long-term care and retirement home settings. So this was all kind of pre-work that had been done before. And, and part of that work was done just kind of recognizing that the risk was there. And part of it was recognizing the risk is there for other illnesses. This didn't happen equally across the country. And there's a variety of reasons why that didn't happen. Um, I think one, many would argue that public health has been systematically underfunded uh, across the country for, for years. Um, and we were almost at this really weak spot where SARS happened in the early 2000s. There was a big influx of funding and support for public health action um, that kind of culminated in the early, uh, I guess the late so like 2008, 2009, 2010, when organizations like Public Health Ontario came into a force and, and hired a large number of physicians and were really excellent organizations. And, and over time, as nothing happened, right, like as we didn't have pandemics, funding gets cut away, right? We all know this. And um, I think most people listening to this talk will come from policy backgrounds. So recognize that policy um you know, whenever there's nothing happening, it's kind of an easy spot to save a few dollars. And, and the year before the pandemic hit, Public Health Ontario had their budget completely slashed, which ended up really um, hampering uh, the lab's capacity to test for COVID um, and to provide guidance around COVID. As well, Ontario is kind of an interesting structure because local public health is kind of cost shared between municipalities and provincial public health. And we were lucky here in Kingston and KFLNA region that our municipalities were very supportive of public health. We have strong relationships with them and they're very supportive. And they had put quite a lot of funding <laughs> into the health unit that isn't necessarily um, equal across the province. And so different health units had different kind of capacity to deal with this and different health units had different burdens of disease. Here in Kingston, we were very lucky. We were sheltered from a lot of the, the um, uh, impacts of COVID early on because we didn't really have a lot of direct travel in and out of the country for people living in our region. Um, and we didn't have a lot of people working in a high risk transmission setting. So places like factories um, that, that were really driving some transmission and, and those multi-generational homes that were driving transmission early on where you know one person would get sick and then everyone else in the household would get sick. And so we were able to kind of keep COVID out of our, our nursing homes because of a strong response locally and local 
fortuitous factors that couldn't weren't necessarily replicated across the country for a variety of reasons. And unfortunately, that resulted in a mass amount of mortality that was unnecessary. Um, these are um, individuals that um, did not deserve to die from this illness. Um, it, it is it is unnecessary death, right? And and um, the the case fatality rate in some of these nursing homes was, you know, upwards of ten percent, twenty percent, that sort of thing. Like, you know, you had people, huge numbers of people dying. Um, and and part of the challenge, what was what happening in in some of these nursing homes is that um, the staff were scared. They didn't have appropriate PPE. They weren't even showing up to work. So then you ended up with people developing problems that weren't even necessarily associated with COVID, but were still not getting addressed because they weren't getting the care that they needed. As well, there were um, even later in the pandemic, we were seeing that. Um, people who were infected and people who were not infected with COVID were still being cohorted in the same rooms. And we also know that um, there are, um, say hello to my daughter and my husband, um, that um, people were still living in, in communal rooms. And it's been said to be the standard in nursing homes for quite a while now that people should be single living spaces, so single individuals own bathroom is kind of the standard, but that not every nursing home had yet achieved that standard. And we just didn't have enough spaces across the province to create safer environments for people. Anyone who worked in, in a hospital, honestly, before 2020 knows how difficult it was to get nursing home spots, um, how difficult it was to get people in. So you, we still had the existence of things like quad rooms, four people in a room. And that's just, again, a sitting duck for spread of disease. Um, and this, we were still seeing these sorts of outbreaks late into COVID when we understood the need for IPAC, when we understood that, um, so infection prevention and control IPAC, we understood the need for PPE, personal uh, protective equipment, and we just still were running into trouble because of um, lack of education for staffing, lack of support for staffing, a lot of people um, working in these environments are low paid um, and and that's like a whole talk I could give honestly about um, the valuing of work that's being done by people working in these environments. And essentially it just resulted in a catastrophe um, and a, ca a catastrophe that we should never allow our uh, to, to happen again. And the problem is, is that even if we don't see another virus like COVID come up, Influenza pandemics will cause these same problems and we need to be prepared societally. And this is a huge area of focus that thankfully I started to see some political action on. Um, and I think that we might see some policy changes around expectations on this because it's completely unacceptable. The other burden that individuals living in, in care environments have faced, um, which is also particularly painful is this idea of isolation. So um, even, um, restrictions to access exist, I mean, still exist. People are having difficulty, um, you know, leaving their homes, essentially, um, and facing um, the inability to see loved ones for extended periods of time. And, um, you know, it's especially when we consider that a lot of people living in care um, might be facing um, cognitive issues and, you know, seeing family can help orient them and help provide excellent care. To limit those access, not only limited their access to care because of that kind of unpaid work that family members were often doing, but also limited their access to um, uh, support and emotional support um, that I, I think we've all recognized through the, the pandemic is, is hugely important. We all deserve um, to have relationships that are meaningful. Um, and when you have a, a group of people that particularly struggle with, you know, things like Zoom, they, they were, uh, you know, isolated. Um, and that's, that's harmful. The next group that I'm going to address is people that have other illnesses. So this is another thing that has kind of really 
really rocked our health system. Um, oh, I see a question has popped up. Let me see, Cynthia. What are some concrete steps that can be done to support individuals in care? Love it. Uh, a few concrete steps would be, um, I think we're seeing improved pay in long-term care homes, which is excellent because it reduces, this isn't even something I talked about, but a lot of people work in more than one environment because they can't get enough full-time hours in one place. Um, and so therefore they're working in multiple homes and therefore we're spreading disease from home to home, which is not good. Um, we uh, also know that turnover makes it harder to enact policies within an organization. So if you want to have strong IPAC, you want to have people that have been working there for a long time. Um, and um, it's so it's really important to try to keep your kind of staff consistent and, and improved pay and benefits can help do that. Um, and then um, having um, having strong policies around expectations in terms of accreditation. I know that accreditation of long-term care homes, retirement homes has not necessarily been robust for a long time. Um, and, and that needs to change. There needs to be standards and expectations that are kept. I think another thing that I didn't touch upon, but is I should have. And so thanks for triggering me to think of this is that we saw that for profit homes had dramatically worse outcomes than not for profit homes. Um, and I think it just highlights the fact that um, profit margins really can work against the, um, the, the motives of providing excellent care in these sorts of environments. Um, and uh, to, there's kind of a, a, an incentive to um, spend as little as possible um, in order to provide care, but that can actually result in some pretty negative consequences. Um, and so I, I, I think that there's room to work on um, removing the profit angle from um, long-term care environments as well. Those are a few ideas. This was something that we actually talked about with our students in help the um, MPA 8, gosh, which class number was it? I can't remember what the name is, health policy that for the um, MPA students last winter, and they had some great ideas as well. Um, those are just a few of them, but there's honestly, it's a multifactorial problem, right? It's a complex issue. There's lots of inputs, lots of issues, and, and lots of things that need to be done. Um, and I think, you know, uh, there's, there's room to move the needle on this. So going on into people with other illnesses, um, one thing that we noticed early on in the pandemic was that people avoided seeking urgent care. Um, and, and I give the story, um, I have a, a friend who's um, family member, not family member, sorry, um, friend was found dead at home from a ruptured appendicitis. This was not in Canada, this was somewhere else, but regardless, that is an that is what's considered an unnecessary death and an ex excess, um, kind of a, a preventable death, right? That's a death that um, if that individual had accessed care earlier, they would not have had a ruptured appendicitis and a sepsis at home that resulted in their death. Maybe they, you know, bleeding, whatever. That would have been managed surgically um, and uh, is very treatable surgically. Um, and typically if people present for healthcare, they don't die from that problem. But um, you, you can die from that problem if you don't seek care. And people were scared of catching COVID in the hospital, um, but they also were worried about kind of being an unnecessary burden on the hospital system. And people have complex decision um, kind of factors that influence why they choose to access care when they do. But regardless, there were incentives for people to not access care. And that was a significant concern um, and likely did contribute somewhat to the excess mortality that we've seen. As well, we know that um, there's a lot of screening programs that are in place in um, across Canada to catch illness at a stage which is treatable before it progresses. Um, and um, one example of that is many cancer screening programs, um, but not even cancer screening programs, cancer diagnostic programs are also important. So people present with symptoms and then they get worked up for those symptoms. And what we saw is that um, in Alberta, in British Columbia, in 2020, they saw a dramatic decrease, about 20 to 23% decrease in the number of cancers that were diagnosed in the period, the six months after COVID started. There is no way that cancer stopped happening, right? We didn't just stop seeing cancer develop. It's that people weren't presenting either with early symptoms or they presented with early symptoms, but they couldn't get the next step in the workup. 
and, and therefore the diagnosis wasn't happening. The other thing is if screening programs are put on hold, things like screening colonoscopies or um, uh, mammograms, that sort of thing, um, you're, you're just not going to catch them as early and people are going to present much later in the illness course. And if they present later, they're less likely to be easily treated in some cases. Um, and so um, even um, uh, here in Ontario at Princess Margaret Hospital, they found that referrals um, in the summer of 2020 for gastrointestinal cancers and for breast cancers were down 38 and 40% respectively versus um, the year before. And again, it's not like breast cancer stopped happening. Um, and so that's 40% of those cases that likely advanced in disease before being caught. Um, and, and so that's going to make a bubble as well, right? So if we have um, a, a delay in diagnosis, then those people are going to need to be diagnosed later. But the, the cancer rates are still kind of chugging along. And so the people that need to be diagnosed at that time also still need to be diagnosed, but they're not going to be able to get surgery because the person who should have presented or could have presented six months earlier presents then and needs surgery. And so it ends up being in this kind of excess diagnosis um, or excess push for diagnosis, and then that can, can lead to ramifications down the line. But we're not going to see the excess death from cancer right away. We're, we're, it's going to take a little bit of time, right? And so we're, you know, expecting to see in the next few years that we'll, we might see changes. Um, and, and I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what we're going to see. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if we saw an increase in cancer mortality um, because of these changes in usage patterns um, early in the pandemic. So, Looking just in health in general, here in um, Canada, um, in on in we saw um, if you look at this graph, I can actually use my mouse because I'm looking here, right? So um, we estimate what kind of deaths we usually see per year, and so um, typically uh, you see a higher rate of, of mortality kind of in the winter, which we're not actually capturing here. This is going from March to October, um, but typically influenza leads to a bit of an increase in deaths usually, and then otherwise often our deaths are kind of fairly stable throughout the year. Um, in Canada, and there's kind of an upper bound of expectations and a lower bound of expectations because you can expect some variability, right? Um, it's never going to be completely stable, but but we don't expect to see huge variations outside of these bounds. And what we saw in 2020 was that um, the expected number of deaths versus the adjusted number of deaths that were actually seen um, spiked substantially um, later in the year. Um, and it's kind of started spiking, um, not actually quite right away um, with COVID. It did maybe a little bit, but then we're really seeing above the upper bounds of expectations for the last, rest of the year. Um, and, and this is not... Um, all COVID related, right? These aren't all COVID deaths. These are deaths associated with other things. Um, so one area in which we saw excess deaths, um, which I will bring up later as well, um, has to do with um, overdose deaths. So we know that we've seen an increase in overdose deaths associated with COVID. Um, and so if, you know, yes, we're not seeing young people die of COVID, but they're, if they're dying at higher rates of overdose, um, deaths and the overdose deaths are influenced by the pandemic and the actions of the pandemic, then it is kind of an indirect result of the pandemic itself that's leading to those deaths. Um, so th these numbers are pretty stark and we'll get kind of final numbers as the years come, but essentially we're seeing a lot more death than we would have expected in that time period. Oh, geez, type a quote here. That is not what I meant to say. <laughs> um, so this is a picture here um, of an ICU um, uh, patient taken from a news article in Calgary. Um, and I chose to talk about this because I, I have a friend who works in the ICU in Alberta. And she highlighted to me also that the way we've run ICUs throughout the pandemic has also resulted in some pretty substantial consequences that maybe people outside of health systems wouldn't necessarily see. So, um, in order to maintain enough bed capacity for all the expected COVID patients, um, we've had to stop trying to fill those beds. Um, and predictably, ICUs are filled with a variety of 
you know, cases at a given time, some of which are going to be things like strokes or um, cardiac events or infections. And those are going to happen sporadically. But some of those things are actually results of medical intervention. So there's some things like cardiac surgery or esophageal surgery that often result in hospitalization after. And that hospitalization can include ICU time. Um, and so procedures were canceled in order to um, make sure that that person after the procedure wouldn't take up an ICU bed when that ICU bed needed to be saved for other people who um, might come in with COVID. Um, but, but it ends up being that by delaying some of those procedures, we've actually um, influenced the individual's outcome with regards to their surgical outcomes. So, um, the this example she gave me was that cardiac surgery um, maintains a list for people who need things like valve replacements. Um, and they were noticing that the number of people that finally got to the top of the list because the list had slowed down in movement because they were holding, they were not holding procedures as often because they were saving ICU beds. Um, they were seeing that people would get to the time when they would qualify, but then they were so unwell that they didn't actually qualify for surgery anymore and therefore were made palliative and therefore died from their cardiac condition. And those are individuals that didn't need to die from their cardiac condition. Maybe they would have had complications after surgery. Some of them would have died after the surgery, but they were kind of, their opportunity for potential health was taken away because the surgical opportunity was taken away. And again, when you think about people dying from COVID, that's not necessarily who you picture, but we know that those are people that are are facing morbidity and mortality associated with COVID unnecessarily um, because, of, uh, because of changes to health system functioning during COVID. Health systems fundamentally are fragile and complex and our health system is functioning at 100% at all times at a baseline. Anyone who's worked in a hospital sees that. It's rare that we have a lot of beds free. Um, it's rare that the ICU has a lot of capacity, additional capacity. And so in order to free up capacity with worry for people getting COVID, you know, they have to take action to reduce usage and, and that has ramifications and consequences. Um, and finally, at this point, we're still seeing restrictions to access to hospitals. Um, my husband works at the hospital. He's an um, internal medicine and, and critical care fellow. And um, the, the number of times during the pandemic that they're being called in to assess individuals who have, you know, um, delirium and other things that make it so that they can't really communicate well, you know, obviously still is happening, but those people don't necessarily always have someone sitting in the bed, you know, in the chair beside them um, for a variety of reasons because of COVID restrictions. The, the visitors have been restricted and therefore it's hard to get the story. Anyone who's worked um, admitting patients in the hospital before knows that it can be very difficult to get a history without a, a, a a loved one or caregiver with that individual giving you the backstory. Um, and, and that likely results in, in worse care and, and therefore worse outcomes. Things can get missed um, because we don't have all the information. And I, I've heard other stories from people um, telling similar things without having the advocate with them. Um, it's not possible for, for the individual's care to um, be as complete as it should be. Um, and there's still ongoing restrictions to, to visitors in the hospital. Um, you know, if you're going in, I, I have friends who are going in for their anatomy scan and that sort of thing, and they're, and they're not allowed to bring anyone with them anymore. And, and those harms are small in comparison, but those harms are still real. Um, and it's important that we acknowledge those as, as having ramifications. Another group that has faced a significant burden with regards to COVID-19 is women and children in general. Um, uh, there is substantial impact, particularly for women with regards to COVID. So um, with regards directly to COVID and, and women, um, there's a substantial increases um, in, in a few meta-analyses that have been done. Um, they've seen increases in stillbirth and maternal death and postnatal depression, um, as well as surgically managed ectopic pregnancies, which means that the, um, the, those pregnancies 
Ideally, you catch ectopic pregnancy earlier and can treat it medically rather than having to have surgery. Surgery is an emergency situation um, and it can be life threatening. And, and so all of those things were increased um, during the pandemic. Um, and so that's outside of COVID altogether. Um, but but um, those are all kind of things that directly impact women, um, particularly pregnant women. With regards to COVID itself directly, pregnant women also carry a disproportionate burden. Seven to 15% of, of COVID infections in pregnancy result in hospitalization, at least when we were looking at unvaccinated populations, which is huge. Um, and um, women who've been diagnosed with COVID-19 have substantial increases in the rates of maternal mortality, um, uh, ICU admission, um, preeclampsia, eclampsia, in uh, preterm birth, which can have, you know, long-term ramifications for that child. So there's definitely impacts for women with regards to COVID, but the next thing that kind of really, I guess this really brings out my ire, I really drives me nuts, um, is how much um, anti-vaccine um, messaging has been going directly to um, women who are looking to conceive or who are pregnant to scare them out of being vaccinated. Um, in the United States, it's something like only about 30% of pregnant women are vaccinated, despite, you know, 60% of the population having been vaccinated. And likely that has to do with people having fear around um, the safety of the vaccine in the context of their pregnancy or their fertility. And you can see anything like this online. And I hear this from patients all the time where, you know, I've heard that it can make me infertile. I've heard the vaccine can make it so that I can't have babies. And, and I reassure people with observational studies to, you know, the observational studies that have been done since December of last year, looking at women who are pregnant or trying to conceive um, and therefore having pregnancies after vaccination. And, and there's been no difference. There's no evidence. There's no reason to think that the vaccine would cause any issues there. Um, but uh, people are preying on, on the, the fears of this population. And, and given that they're at such a higher rate of consequences, both for themselves and their babies, um, it's, it's particularly grotesque to see this sort of action coming out. Um, and when, um, when we're talking about um, vaccine hesitancy um, and, and lack of data, I think one other thing that really pains me is the fact that um, the initial studies didn't include any women who were pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, I think when we're talking about something like a vaccine, which we have no reason to think will cause any problems, um, there should be kind of an imperative to study this group because these are people who deserve um, access to treatment the same way as anyone else. Um, but fundamentally, um, they're just not studied. And um, the, the lack of information and the lack of study leads to people making decisions um, saying, you know, the lack of data is the reason I'm not vaccinated, which is challenging and problematic. So um, that's another kind of pet peeve of mine. But continuing on with the theme of women and children, a lot of disproportionate impacts associated with the pandemic actions have, have impacted women. So um, the uh, women face a disproportionate burden in terms of child care. Um, and when schools were closed, that has a significant impact on the careers of the women um, who are trying to work from home and homeschool or manage, honestly, the children and manage um, the lack of care that they have and lack of support that they have. Despite the fact that, you know, you might have a two-parent working household, disproportionately women take on that burden. Um, and therefore, they face disproportionate economic impacts if they end up having to leave their job, for instance, um, due to providing childcare. As well, women are typically working in jobs that are more vulnerable to loss. So more women work in retail services or food services, um, and therefore we're at higher risk of just losing employment um, whenever pandemic actions resulted in lockdowns. And again, that's a disproportionate burden in terms of kind of familial risk with regards to poverty. Women working, um, women have had faced disproportionate rates of getting COVID at work because women were working much more likely to be working in healthcare related jobs. So jobs like PSWs and nurses are disproportionately female. And um, so they were facing that burden of risk early on in the pandemic. 
Um, and then finally, um, the lack of access to health care for um, particularly reproductive health care. So here in Kingston, our sexual health clinics have closed um, across the country. Similar things have happened, which lim can limit women's access to things like safe contraception, um, which is uh, problematic. Um, and then finally, um, to add to all of this, as if all of this isn't enough, um, the, the worry around pandemic lockdowns can also um, increases the rates of violence against women and children um, due to partly the stressors, uh, partly due to you know not being able to leave unsafe environments and. Um, rates of domestic violence and partner abuse increase globally. Um, a re single report from Brazil showed a, a 40 to 50% increase in domestic violence. We don't really have great numbers on this, but we, we know it's happening more um, and it's likely related to a variety of elements with regards to pandemic actions. Um, in terms of children, um, children, particularly children not accessing school is a major issue. And this has the potential of disproportionately impacting children coming from um, poverty environments. So um, education improves lifelong outcomes with regards to things like income. And um, uh, when you're uh, a child that might not be in an environment that's particularly academically enriching at home, um, school is very, very important. And to lose that is really um, potentially very harmful. The other harms that these stu students face um, can, can relate to um, uh, the mental health impacts, um, and also not accessing food programs. So we know a lot of kids um, get their most nutritious meals at school through school food programs. Um, and without uh, those being in place, they're not able to access that and face the risks from malnutrition. Um, finally, uh, virtual teaching is not something that's equal um, in terms of access across the country or internationally. Um, people coming, um, children in households that can't afford to buy virtual devices, you know, um, or, you know, rural environments where the internet is not that good. Um, those are groups that kind of face substantial risk to their education. But fundamentally, um, in-person education for children is so important for a variety of reasons, including social development. Um, and we know that there's just so much data showing us that education is hugely important in terms of child outcomes and lifelong outcomes and to lose a year is is um potentially very harmful and i think we're going to have to watch the cohort as they move forward um to see the long-term ramifications next group to talk about has to do um, with uh, people in terms of their risk of getting COVID. So um, in Toronto during, I guess this would have been more wave two, um, we saw a huge um, disproportionate amount of um, cases of COVID-19 among racialized group. Um, and um, there, uh, my daughter would like to come say hi. Um, so, um, in the city, about 50% of the population um, would be considered racialized, um, but about 80% of cases were found in racialized groups. And um, the rate of COVID-19 infections in diverse neighborhoods was three times higher than the least diverse neighborhoods. And the people living in these diverse neighborhoods were also more likely to experience severe outcomes. So four times higher rate of hospitalization, four times higher rate of ICU admission, two times higher rates of death, um, just a really substantial disproportionate impact. And there's a lot of things to unpack here as to why. Multi-generational households is likely part of it. Um, poverty is likely part of it. And, and working in um, work environments that um, are not able to be work from home type environments. So people working factory jobs, food service jobs that were required to continue going to work despite the risk of COVID. Um, and as soon as, you know, one person getting COVID and then moving, going home and having lots of household members at home, then they're all at risk of getting sick. Um, and then also there's um, the, the physical strain on people of racism is substantial. Um, we know that um, there is harm to people um, just from the stress of, of um, racism that can lead to increased rates of things like hypertension. And that puts people at higher risk of worse outcomes from COVID. And so racism directly is kind of, is, is contributing to the poverty and the risk from poverty. That's um, but they're also, um, racism is also kind of contributing to the health factors that can worsen their, 
COVID outcomes. Um, as well, we saw in terms of poverty, which is tied with um, racialized groups, not always one and the same. Um, we saw that, um, again, looking at November of 2020, about half of COVID cases um, were uh, among those living in households that would be considered lower income, despite 30% of the population having the same definition. Um, and uh, again, it's related to this idea of essential jobs, um, but it can also be because people lack sick day protections. Um, this is something the government has not moved on, and it really frustrated me. Um, if you don't incentivize people to stay home when they have symptoms, then they're going to lie on their screening because they're at risk of losing their job. And it's not that they're antisocial people, it's that they face substantial household and individual risk in terms of losing their employment and therefore their um, income. And so they're incentivized to go to work, even symptomatic, and they're incentivized not to go get a swab done because they don't want to find out that they're COVID positive, which can result in substantial outbreaks. So you really need controls in those environments to help reduce spread. Um, and you need to give people the ability to stay home when they're sick. And that hasn't happened. Um, and it needs to be legislated. Businesses aren't doing it themselves at a high enough rate anyway. Um, People living in neighborhoods that were experiencing the highest level of material deprivation, again, were more likely to experience severe outcomes. Hospitalization rates were almost 70% higher. Uh, ICU admission rates were two times higher. Death rates were 50% higher. And the pandemic generally has widened the gap between the rich and the poor. Continuing on to um, what I was mentioning before, um, certain populations of on in Ontario um, have uh, experienced disproportionate increases in opioid-related harm during the pandemic as well. I'm working with some students on a project on this right now. We've seen a dramatic increase in the number of COVID deaths, uh, of, sorry, overdose deaths in KFLNA region during COVID. Um, and uh, the groups that kind of saw this happen the most were in people living in more rural communities, more northern communities, men, individuals between the ages ages of 20 and 49, people that are experiencing housing instability or homelessness, um, neighborhoods with higher uh, ethno-cultural diversity, um, and people who have either um, experienced incarceration or who have been recently released from prison. And it's thought that there's a few factors as to why overdose deaths have increased. The first is that um, the mental stress associated with the pandemic has altered people's usage patterns of um, drugs that can result in overdose, um, but also the pandemic itself um, led to rules around physical distancing and isolation. People couldn't necessarily access um, safe places to use, um, and they couldn't necessarily find people to use with. So we often give the advice to individuals to find, you know, to use with someone else and have naloxone present so that if somebody's overdosing, they can get treated immediately and, and emergency services can be called. But if you're by yourself because you're told to isolate, you can't, nobody's going to be there to help you. And then finally, um, border and travel restrictions. Apologies. Um, uh, border and travel restrictions um, led to um, a lack of safe supply of COVID, of, um, of drugs. So um, that led to kind of changes in what people were getting. And, and if you don't know what you're getting, um, it's very hard to get the right amount so that you are treating your addiction without going too high um, and resulting in overdose. So last bit, um, I have like, I'll take one, two more minutes really quickly, um, diving into vaccine equity. So worldwide, we've seen that um, 6.7 billion doses have been administered. Um, so that's a substantial portion of the um, over 12 population worldwide. And yet somehow as of October 13th, only 3.88% of people in low-income countries have had a single dose. And, and so it doesn't take much to see the dramatic inequity here. Um, we still internationally lack waivers for um, IP protections for COVID-19 vaccines to allow them to be produced widely. Um, the creators of the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine did give the rights to other um, groups uh, to make their, their vaccine, but that has not happened widely. And the profits that um, Pfizer and Moderna are seeing based on their vaccine are, are truly um, unnecessarily high. Um, there's, there's, a, there's probably a sweet spot in terms of allowing companies who've done the thing that we needed because we needed a vaccine um, and rewarding that and kind of this, this income to excess that is um, making it really difficult for lower income countries to access vaccines. So you can see here um, 
in terms of the rollout of doses administered, high income countries have administered over 3 billion doses of vaccine, upper middle income, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, upper middle income countries have kind of uh, provided a substantial amount, uh, kind of more around the 2 billion mark, and then lower middle income countries are close to half of half a billion. So you can see how this really adds up to all of our um, vaccine administration. Low income countries just don't uh, register. They just aren't getting doses. Um, and, and this actually results in some substantial inequity worldwide. Um, the cost of vaccines is so great that low income countries have to increase their healthcare spending to administer the vaccines by over 50%. Um, whereas, you know, healthcare spending had to increase by 0.8% here. And we're talking about that, right? In Canada, we talk about how much extra healthcare spending we're having based on COVID. And it's a drop in the bucket compared to what lower income countries with less stable health systems are having to spend. And that's a huge burden, right? The amount of burden that they face in order to administer vaccines is substantial. Um, COVAX has provided a global risk sharing mechanism for pool procurement and equal distribution, but clearly it's not working particularly quickly. Um, and this just ends up having a domino effect. Reorienting limited funds towards vaccination can substantially impact the economic recovery in these countries and also require these countries to keep more restrictions in place for longer, which again is gonna have a disproportionate impact on people who are in precarious work. And, and really from a worldwide perspective, we want better vaccine coverage. Um, we have higher risks of variant development um, during uh, outbreaks in other countries that have vulnerable population to the virus, and we won't see uh, variants arise if we have if we don't have a vulnerable population. And so, it's in all of our best interests to get vaccine distributed worldwide. And um, I think it's problematic that there's so much talk around third doses when two doses has proven very efficacious um, for most people at keeping them out of hospital and preventing transmission. Um, but uh, we've got so much of the, um, the world that has still yet to be vaccinated. And finally, um, in terms of vaccine hesitancy, we also see issues here in Canada, and those issues are complex. And I think a lot of us um, are conflating, unfortunately, anti-vax individuals with vaccine hesitant individuals. Um, Anti-vax is a very small minority of people who have not been vaccinated. Um, most people who have not been vaccinated lack trust in the health system. And unfortunately, a lot of those individuals have good reason to lack trust. This is an image um, from a CMAJ article on medical experimentation among Indigenous people in Canada and the roots of COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. And we know that there is substantial reason for distrust um, of this group um, due to the violence of colonialism and where um, historically, uh, Indigenous people have faced um, harms from the health system, um, uh, tuberculosis relocation, um, introduction from um, settlers of, of various diseases that um, can be treated. And, and this is similar also for racialized populations. Um, Tuskegee and, and the syphilis experimentation where syphilis was treatable and they chose not to treat a large group of uh, black individuals for syphilis in order to follow the long-term sequelae of the disease, you can see how people might not trust the health system. And if they don't trust the health system, they're less likely to be vaccinated. And that's something we need to own. That's not something that we can place on that individual and blame them for not being vaccinated. We need to uh, really address these reasons for distrust and help create structures for trust in order to improve vaccine acceptance. Um, the vast majority of people I've seen that are vaccine hesitant um, are, have have good justification um, and, and have fear and anxiety. And, and um, it's partly uh, our societal's fault, society's fault for kind of creating that lack of trust. So that's just a bit of what I covered. Really, COVID-19 has exacerbated existing inequities in society. Um, and I hope that I've been able to address a few of those with you today. Um, I didn't see any other questions pop up, but I'm happy to take a few more questions in the last couple minutes that we have. Thank you for listening. I hope it was interesting. <laughs> it's always weird giving these talks on Zoom because you can't really see the audience, um, but I, I hope that it was uh, interesting for you. And thank you for joining. I wanted to thank you for that uh, presentation, uh, uh, Sam. It was uh, you really covered a broad range of <laughs> related <laughs> issues, and I think that was this, that was a re really good reminder of how those how everything is.
connected and that we might have a sort of tend to have a kind of limited view and that having that global perspective as well, I think is particularly so important. Precisely, I, I notice now that the discussion is so much this um, sort of post pandemic, but um, post pandemic really, really depends on where you're sitting. So um, maybe I'm not sure if you would address that as much as because we have a, a something come come up here on in the chat. Volume of research on COVID is extensive. Could you give us an idea of how to spot research that we should not be using or trusting? Well, so I mean, we could do a whole course on critical appraisal of research literature. Um, I think one thing that we've seen explode is the existence of preprints, which are um, not reviewed literature, and, and that can be somewhat problematic. I understand the need to get data out quickly, but you should always kind of that should flag something um, if something has not been peer reviewed. Um, just that, you know, take it with a grain of salt. It's not necessarily that it's wrong. Um, it's that it, it has not yet been reviewed by individuals with expertise. Um, in general, I think some of the best information on COVID has come out through collaborations um, and, and guidance documents. I tend to go there instead of going to the literature directly. So if I can go to Public Health Ontario and read a review that they've written, I have I have friends that work there. I have confidence in their ability to address, um, assess methods of research um, and therefore quality of data and include only high quality data or acknowledge the quality of their data in their documents that they're providing. And so understanding which organizations you can go to for high quality research is also helpful because fundamentally there's so much primary research that's coming out that it's impossible to sift through it all anyway. Um, and there are people who are paid to do it. So I tend to, um, <laughs> I tend to appreciate that. Um, BCCDC also does some really excellent work. And um, there's also groups um, in uh, the science table groups have put out some interesting documents that you can look to. Um, but yeah, there's so much primary literature and, and so much of it is not peer reviewed that that's kind of a bit of a flag to me. Um, okay, addressing poverty, I'm going to answer this live. Would addressing poverty be the priority to help minimize the inequities we see or just increase education awareness for society? A hundred percent. Addressing poverty is the number one thing that we can do in society in general. And it supports all of us. Um, if we have more people who have more money, then they spend their money. If there's one thing that we've seen, um, I'm not an economist, but I have a few economist friends and I've talked about this with some pretty educated people. When you have people that are lower income and they make more money, they typically spend that money in their community. Um, whereas when richer people make money, they put it in offshore banks and they don't pay tax on it. And, and so when as a society, so much of our in so much of our economic activity comes from kind of local spending and individual um, kind of spending in our society. Uh, and then beyond that taxation, it really helps us to boost the lower class in terms of economic functioning in order to um, improve our income as a society. And so that's why um, we're going to see a lot of kind of funding programs. And that's why, I mean, gosh, there's, I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm probably one of the people that would support a basic income as being a really simple way to put a lot of money in people's pockets. But even beyond that, I think we're doing a lot to tackle poverty um, across Canada that, that can have substantial impact. So for instance, um, uh, childcare, gosh, that has been a huge problem. Like just the number of people that have faced disproportionate burdens based on childcare issues. Um, and to have $10 a day daycare across the country would be huge in terms of improving people's access to the workforce. And it has worked dramatically well in, in Quebec and we need it across the country. And so there are different ways that we can fund kind of support people um, in terms of uh, poverty. I think also we're seeing a, a shift in terms of people's uh, uh, acceptance of work environments. So people are not willing to go back to low paid jobs. Um, they're not interested in going back to food service where they're not given benefits and they're not given any job security. Um, and I think we're, we're seeing employers actually change their tactics in terms of increasing wages um, and increasing benefits, which has a benefit for, again, the lowest income of our society. Um, but if 
we can provide childcare, we can get a whole group of people that have not been able to access the workforce into the workforce and therefore, again, reduce um, reduce poverty in those groups. So that's, I, I, I would totally vote for tackling poverty. It's not the only thing, um, but it's a big contributor. Absolutely. Um, and going back to what you were saying, Jennifer, um, we have like a minute. Um, in terms of um, uh, the pandemic, it's uh, 100% true. Um, the pandemic is not going to, the United States is not going to reach a high enough vaccination rate anytime soon, that we're going to continue to get cases imported through international travel, along with um, uh, travel to other countries that have not yet been fully vaccinated. So none of us are out of this until we're all out of this, really. I mean, we're never going to be quite out of it, um, but we can really mitigate the impacts of the virus by having widespread vaccination. And I, I worry for some of our less vaccinated populations, like um, there are some kind of cohorts of people that are, are more hesitant than others. And, and those groups are at high risk of consequences if, if, if COVID hits those populations. Um, and that's not going to change unless they get vaccinated, right? So a year from now, that could still be a problem. Two years from now, that could still be a problem. And then again, like I mentioned internationally, I mean, we're all at risk when anyone's at risk in terms of development of variants. Um, last question, where do I see us being one year from now? I mean, our vaccination rates are continuing to climb and I think they're going to continue. I think vaccine hesitancy and lack of trust in government is a substantial problem in the United States and the individualism that is kind of fostered within the culture of the United States is really hurting them in this context. Um, and I, I think it's going to be much harder for them to reach substantial levels of vaccination, but they're going to reach herd immunity at some point because of infection, right? Um, we are not seeing enough infection rates here in Canada to get to herd immunity because our rates of COVID are so low. But in some regions in the United States, the outbreaks are so substantial that they're starting to creep up higher and higher and higher in terms of, of infections. And so I don't know when they're gonna hit that sweet spot of seeing reduced cases, but they will eventually. Um, we've probably seen coronavirus outbreaks um, and pandemics you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago that we never really knew um, because people died all the time <laughs> and we didn't really have global surveillance and we didn't have vaccines. So we just kind of dealt with it. Um, but uh, uh, typically coronaviruses are very, are really mild in young kids. And then people get, everyone gets them as a kid and then everyone has immunity the rest of their life. And then it doesn't matter if you get a coronavirus. We have coronavirus outbreaks that we've detected for years at long-term care homes but nobody, like they're really low mortality events because people are already kind of immune when they're exposed. Um, they're not fully immune, they can still get infected, but they're immune from the severe impact. So, so we'll, we'll eventually get to that point. I don't know how long it'll take. Um, I think here in Canada, we're slowly creeping out of our pandemic restrictions. Um, and I think, you know, every, every, a lot of people had Thanksgiving this year, people are going to do Christmas and holidays this year. Um, I think we're going to start to see more international travel in 2022. I think our restrictions are going to start continuing to drop off and we're actually going to stop needing things like vaccine passports because our vaccination rates are going to be so high. But um, I think the United States is going to be in for a bit of a challenge for a while yet. Yeah. So yes, educated guess. Yeah, and again, the, how the national situation is always impacted by the international. It just can't be stated oh, enough. And then the international politics that, oh, yes. uh, and flow and the, the way that the media can influence uh, uptake or lack of uptake for all sorts of different kinds of public health measures. Just uh, very, very influential. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Such a very, very interesting hour spent with you. Thank you, Dr. Butemir, and thank you everybody who could come by and um, yeah, have a enjoy the sun. I guess yes, uh, as a, a, fun, a fun, a fun thing to say. Some. Nice weather and uh, yeah, thank you. I'll close thank the you. meeting. Okay, bye-bye.